You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, and God bless you, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, I am going to record in my hermitage, and unfortunately, this light bulb keeps going in and out, so when it comes back on, you'll be able to see me better, but... Hopefully I can scoot over to the right here enough that you can see my Jesus. The problem about a tiny hermitage is there's not really much space unless you're a professional to set up a camera and to record. But I thought as we continue to prepare in Advent for Christmas that this would be a beautiful place to um, record the the podcast this week. So we're going to start with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And then we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about Isaiah, and we're going to talk about the O antiphons this week, and how the Lord is asking us to prepare for the coming of Jesus through those different spiritual means, right? Scriptural means. So we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile. Until the Son of God appear, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Come, O rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny, from depths of hell thy people save. Make safe the 
path to misery Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel O come, O come, thou Lord of might, who to thy tribes on Sinai's height. In ancient times did skip the Cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm going to have to do without that light. It's been flickering on and off, but it's stuck off. So, we shall do what we shall do. And the problem with the Hermitage, why I don't do more recordings here, is... um especially now in winter, the lighting's off, and then I have to have the heater on because it's kind of cold. <laughs> and I turned it on, a, you know, an hour and a half ago, but it's still not warm enough to turn it off. So I think with the microphone you can hear me. What I would like to talk about this week is um, the idea of the waiting Jewish people and their preparation for the coming of, of Christ to kind of help you enter into their hearts, especially through Isaiah, right? And then I'm going to touch at the end on the O antiphons. You know, O come, O come, Emmanuel. You know, O come, key of David. O Lord of might. And I'll go through. O wisdom is one, you know? And I want to touch on that so that you can really kind of come to feel that Jewish heart, that longing that the people of God had for years and years and years leading up to the coming of Jesus. And it's interesting when you look at all of Advent, you know, I kind of looked at all of the readings um, during Advent, to be quite honest, and I noticed each of the weeks kind of a different theme. And kind of what I pulled out was, um, you know, the first week of Advent focuses a lot on um, repentance, on changing your life. And, you know, that's why I did the podcast on poverty, um, because that's something concrete you can look at. What is it taking up my heart that really should be left empty and waiting and longing for God, right? And we hear John the Baptist calling people to repent. And, you know, that longing is building up, right? It's a, it's a, a cry of, um, and I'm going to read a couple of these readings, but it's a cry of repentance. And it's, you know, an act of trust in the people that we're reminded of, that they trust the word of the Lord, that he will come. And it's a thirst. Then the, the, thir the second week of Advent um, has a lot more to do with being a little child. And God is making promises to us, his little children who need him to come. You know, the first week is more, you know, um, you know, repent and change, and it's kind of scouring out the heart. But then that second week is more about being a little child to being the little sheep, being that longing Anna whim, right? The little one, 
that he'll come and save. And then that third week of Advent has to do a lot with spousal imagery and how we are his bridegroom, or he, we are his bride, he is the bridegroom, and how we are the chosen beloved one to him. The same way that, you know, a wife and a bride is the beloved of her bridegroom and her husband. And then the last week deepens that, week, that theme and almost into a consummation of that love. And that is when the incarnation comes and he is consummated. Um, the divine presence is consummated with the flesh of Our Lady to bring forth Jesus. It's so beautiful. So we're going to touch on that. Um, but at the beginning here, I want to go over Isaiah 2, verses 1 to 5. And this is the great promise that's given to the people of Israel, um, you know, who God formed perfect and who always walked with him perfectly in the garden until they doubted and they sinned. And Adam and Eve, it wasn't about eating an apple. It was about not doing the will of God, not obeying wanting to be equal or better than God. And that's what their real sin was, right? But God swooped in and he made a promise that he'd save them. But he had to prepare their heart for that gift of being saved, right? So this is what Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. Now, what was that great mountain that came? You know, Christ came and he came in Bethlehem, but he came as the Savior. And that mountain is Calvary. That mountain that the Lord is going to come down on to save us is here. It's him crucified, right? And all the nations shall stream toward it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us climb the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. Christ had to die on the cross on the mountain of Calvary in order to win the grace so that all nations and all people and all languages would come to him, right? And they did, and they do. And how were they instructed? Through the cross, by the cross, by looking upon him who we pierced, right? For from Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, where he was crucified. He shall judge between the nations and impose terms on many people. But this is how he judges with his arms outstretched, bleeding to give us the grace to accept salvation before he has to come as a harsh judge, right? And it says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So people who want to fight with each other, right? And do evil are gonna come and they're gonna look on him and they're gonna become gentle and peaceful and loving. And they're going to want to help him bear fruit. They're going to want to be a shepherd like him. Instead of using a, a, a um, staff to beat their sheep, you know, their swords and their spears will be turned into plowshares and pruning hooks. Things that can, can be used gently to bear fruit, right? They'll imitate him, the good shepherd, that uses a staff to kind of guide and pull back the sheep to his heart and not to hurt them. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And he won that light for us in his darkness, right? And we also think about Isaiah 63 and 64, where it talks about Jesus being the divine warrior. Who is this that comes from Edom in crimson garments? Who is this glorious in his apparel, striding in the greatness of his strength? It is I who announce vindication, mighty to save. 
well, who is this really strong one in in a great apparel, mighty to be saved, mighty to save? Jesus naked on the cross, who uses his strength to crucify himself, to offer himself as a victim so that we can be saved. And we ask, why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like one who treads the wine press? And Jesus crucified says, the wine press I have trodden alone. And from the people, no one was with me. So we have to think about what it means that the Savior is coming to earth. And that means that we think about the cross even during Advent, right? He talks about his apparel being stained. Well, his clothing is the flesh of humanity and it's stained by his blood. He says, I looked about, but there was no one to help me. I was appalled that there was no one to lend me support. So my own arm brought the victory and my own wrath lent me support. He was so angry against Satan and sin that he did it all on his own. He even cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt forsaken and forgotten by the Father, right? That's the Savior that we celebrate at Christmas. And then it goes on in this, in this passage of Isaiah about the prayer for the return of God's favor. And this tells the story of Jesus coming as the Savior, right? In Bethlehem to die on the cross. And this is the prayer that the Jewish people would pray all of the time and meditate on. And they place their hope in this. The loving deeds of the Lord I will recall. The glorious acts of the Lord. Because of all the Lord has done for us. The immense goodness to the house of Israel. Which he has granted according to his mercy. And his many loving deeds. He said, they are indeed my people, children who are not disloyal. So he became their savior in their every affliction. It was not an envoy or a messenger, but his presence that saved them. Because of his love and pity, the Lord redeemed them, lifting them up and carrying them as in the days of old. Then it goes on to talk about how they rebelled even against such gentle, meek love. You know, and he, he says, you know, why are you not remembering, you know, the one who brought you out of the sea, the shepherd of the flock, the one who guided Moses with his glorious arm, the one who divided the waters, you know? Why are you why are you doubting him? It's such a sad story when you think about the story of Israel and many souls follow in that where God gives us all of this love and grace and people turn from him in sin and he comes back to bleed and to suffer and to get us back and he swoops us up and he saves us and then people run away from him again and it repeats over and over again. But Israel does pray, you, Lord, are our father, our redeemer, you are named of old. Return for the sake of your servants. So they rejected Jesus, but then they're saying return. Well, God never really left them, right? Why have the wicked invaded your holy place? Why have our enemies trampled your sanctuary? Too long have we been like those that you do not rule, on whom your name is not invoked. So they're longing for him, even though it's their fault that he left, that they turned him away. God leaves us free. We are always free to accept or to reject the gift of his love, right? But you can hear here that longing, that thirst developing in the heart of the Israelites. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down with the mountains quaking before you. Well, he did. And the mountain did quake before him on Calvary. When he said, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And he died. There was an earthquake, right? He fulfilled the scripture that was written thousands of years earlier. So the first 
week of Advent, we really focus on John the Baptist. And it's beautiful because it's it's turning from that hardened heart that that um, drove God away, that said no, that rejected his grace, right? God always wanted to swoop us up like his little children. But we have to have um, a willingness to be swooped up, right? And we have to make room in our hearts for him, which is why he pulls us into the wilderness so often. Because we have to be away from the luxury of life, the comforts. We have to give up what we're attached to so that in the wilderness, he can speak to our heart, right? In Hosea, he says, I will lead her into the desert, into the wilderness and speak to her heart. And we read about John the Baptist here. I believe this is from Luke. He went into the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, he was, John the Baptist, right here behind me, right? Was a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight the paths before him. We have to do a preparation in order to truly receive the gift he wants to give us at Christmas. But if we do that, every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways shall be made smooth. All the people will see God's salvation. And John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized, you brood of vipers. He He was rough. He was sharp in his words. Why? To cut away sin in the world. They wouldn't have listened if he wasn't so sharp. You know, when you're tilling the land and preparing it in the spring, you have to use sharp instruments to cut that frozen, hardened land up and to make it, you know, open so that the air can get into it, right? We we need to do that with our own hearts. Cut away in a sharp way sometimes, what's not of God so that the Holy Spirit, the air of the Holy Spirit can come in. He said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, which means change, right? Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into fire. He's not threatening. He's um, he's warning. He's like helping them. He's saying, you know what? Let's apply this to the modern day world. You support abortion, the murder of babies, you're going to fall into hell. Not because God's mean and doesn't forgive you, but because you can't receive the forgiveness of God if you don't recognize your sin and be sorry, right? And there are millions of sins I could go through that are like that. So John the Baptist is sharp and we need to be sharp during Advent to really look what is it in my life that's gangrene and cut it off so that the rest of us doesn't fall into Gehenna, right? And the crowd heard that and they said, "Uh uh-oh, you know, we're in trouble. What should we do then? And John said, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. Anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more taxes than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? And he said, don't exhort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. But John answered them all and says, and said, I baptize you with water, right? I'm coming hard to prepare the, the um the heart of your land, but one who is more powerful than I will come and who is more meek and gentle. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. How do we approach God? Pompous as if we deserve it? Or do we come knowing 
that we don't even deserve to untie the sandals of this man crucified. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that first week of Advent from Isaiah, why do you let us wander, O Lord, from your ways and harden our hearts so that we fear you not? Right? Why are you not converting us faster? You know, it's kind of funny that Israel's blaming God for that. They're the ones not responding to grace, right? Why do you let us wander and harden our hearts as if it's God's fault that our hearts get hardened, right? Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that you might need us doing right, that we were mindful of you in our ways. So they're starting to repent. They're starting to see that their hearts are hardened. They're starting to see that they're not mindful of God, and that's good. And they're asking for grace to till that ground. But God's leaving them in the wilderness so that they can really convert. They can really work hard at the conversion of their hearts so that when he comes, they can accept his gift. And what do they say? Come, let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways. We may walk in his paths. But we have to use our will. It doesn't all just come from God. We have to climb the mountain. We have to be willing to not only embrace a cute little baby of Bethlehem, but to love him authentically, which means being faithful to him, even when he grows into a man and he's crucified upon Calvary. Only then will they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You know, on that day, once people really convert their heart, they begin to live the gospel message. Then a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a bud shall blossom. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Then the wolf shall be the guest of the lamb. The leopard shall lay down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. You know, on that day, a little child is guiding the violent. The violent aren't killing the little child. The cow and the bear shall be neighbors. Together their young shall rest. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. The baby shall play in the cobra's den. And the child lay his hand on the adder's lair. There shall be no harm or ruin on all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be filled with knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. He's promising that if we go up Calvary, if we're bathed by his blood, if we root out sin in our hearts in repentance, Calvary's not the end of the story. Jesus came as a savior, which means he suffered and he died, but he rose. And then he ascended into heaven and then he sent the Holy Spirit upon us, right? And then everything is fixed and made new when we stay on that mountain where he was. How do we get there? How do we prepare our hearts besides a good examination of conscience, right? I encourage you this week to really spend some time looking at the manger, looking at the crucifix, and looking at the cross, at the um, Eucharist. And that's how I want you to do your examination of conscience and go to confession to prepare the way of the Lord. How? You know, look at the manger. What are the characteristics of Jesus in Bethlehem that you're not living? And I'll do a podcast later on baby Jesus and all the gifts of, of his presence as a baby. But you can, the Holy Spirit can guide you right now. And then look at the cross How are you not loving like he is? And then look at the the Eucharist where he's silent, where he's humble, where he's always available and generous, where he forgives. How are you not being like that? And make a good confession. Prepare that way of the Lord. And then trust in the Lord forever. Are you trusting him? Are you trusting a God that loves you so much he came from heaven to be a baby, to die, to remain with you in the Eucharist? For the Lord is an eternal rock 
He humbles those in high places and the lofty city he brings down. He tumbles it to the ground. He levels it with the dust. It is trampled underfoot by the needy, by the footsteps of the poor. See again, he's calling us to not be mighty, not be haughty, but to be humble and poor. How can you grow in that this week? On that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book. You know, if you remove material objects and worldly ways of thinking and pride and vice from your heart, from your mind, from your relationships, you know, if you're not jealous of your sibling, but instead you support them, if you don't, you know, keep this relationship is just for me, but instead you share it, you know, then the Lord can bless you. Then you'll hear the words of his book. You'll hear the voice of his love in your heart. Out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. You'll start to see things in reality. 99% of this world doesn't see and judge based on reality. It's through their own sin. It's their own clouded perception of woundedness and worldliness, right? people's opinions I take very, very lightly because they're not the opinions of God. He sees and judges so differently, right? That's why we need to meditate on scripture so that we have the mind of Christ. And when we remove sin, then he helps us to hear what people say to us with his ears. So often people misunderstand. They'll say, so-and-so said this to me. You know, it must mean this. Or, you know, her intention is this. Uh Uh-uh, it's not true. (laughs) You're just, you're hearing and seeing through your own vice, your own woundedness. Or other people's influence that's not Jesus's influence. So we need to repent. We need to change so that we can hear in our deafness his voice. We can see in our blindness with his eyes. The lowly will find joy forever in the Lord, and the poor will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Those who err in spirit will acquire understanding, and those who find fault will receive instruction. So those who are teaching things against the Catholic Church, even if they're, you know, priests or bishops or cardinals, they will acquire understanding if they repent in their personal life, right? Even if they're a politician. And those who find fault shall receive instruction. Those who criticize, those who blame, those who justify will be instructed by the Holy Spirit so that their interactions with people are more loving. He will be gracious to you when you cry out. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. That's God's promise. If you remove the obstacles to his grace, he will hear you. He's promising. He's building the the excitement and the longing in our hearts. The Lord will give you the bread that you need and the water that you thirst for. It might be physical water if you're in the Sahara, but it might be, you know, a thirst for someone to understand or for spiritual guidance or for truth in this world of lies or for love. If people are not loving towards you, you know, a little orphan child longs for love. No longer will your teacher hide himself, but with your own eyes, you shall see your teacher. While from behind a voice shall sound in your ears. This is the way walk in it. When you would turn to the right or the left, if you can remove the obstacles to the grace of God and allow Jesus to come as your savior, as a babe, you know, in a cleaned out heart, you know, our lady and Joseph didn't come into the manger and just like throw Jesus in the dirty corner. They, even though it was poor, they cleaned it. They made it beautiful for him and they loved him in it. Even if our hearts are made of clay, of human material, and we have faults and we have wounds, God wants us to clean it out, to make it beautiful, to love and to praise him there. Then he's happy to come as baby Jesus and rest. And then that's where we allow the crucified Savior to lay his head, right? We make room in our hearts. And after transforming us through his passion, He recreates us through his resurrection and he anoints us with the Holy Spirit. 
The second week of Advent is about being a little child of God. What are the scriptures from Isaiah? Comfort, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to little Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her service is at end. Her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she is received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. The Lord sees you in your pain. Here, you've cut out the vice you can. You've done what you can. Now it's the time for the Lord to come and give you comfort. He didn't come to earth for himself. He came to save us. But see, he can only rescue us if we allow ourselves to be rescued. If we see the reality that we're not big and strong and mighty, but we're little children that need his comfort, right? We need him to speak tenderly to us. Here in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. So we're preparing for him so that he can come. It's a highway in our heart. And every valley is filled in and every mountain and hill made low. The rugged land is made plain. The rough country is made into a broad broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord is revealed and all the people see it together. Like a shepherd, He feeds his flock. He gathers the little lambs, carrying them in his bosom and leading the ewes with care. You know, this next week, so the first week we want to really focus on what can we concretely change in our lives and to repent. Then the Lord comes, you know, when you have surgery to cut off gangrene, then you have to put gentle ointment and baby that area so it heals. The Lord comes to us in littleness. And he loves us like a little lamb. He speaks gently and tenderly to us. Then the desert and the parched land begins to exalt, right? The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful songs. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God, even as we prepare for his coming at Christmas. He doesn't leave us in a harsh, even like Lent. You know, Advent's so easy. We got one week of real hardcore repentance and then he comes already and he's comforting us. He's turning, you know, we go into the desert and he turns that desert into a a lush garden. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us. He says in Isaiah 35, strengthen the hands that are feeble, make firm the knees that are weak, say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not, here is your God. He comes with vindication, with divine recompense, he's coming to save you. Then the eyes of the blind are opened and the ears of the deaf are cleared. Then the lame will leap like a stag. He's promising this to build our hope. The tongue of the mute will sing. Streams will burst forth in the desert, rivers in the steppe. The burning sands will become pools and the thirsty ground springs of water. The abode where the jackals lurk will be a marsh for the reed and the papyrus. A highway will be there. It will be called the holy way. No one unclean may pass over it. That's why you have to really repent that first week. But a fool will not go astray on it. No lion will be there. No beast of prey will go up to be met upon it. Look how he's preparing us. Jesus is coming as a little baby. And he's preparing us as little children. We're supposed to imitate him in that, right? And he's promising to do all of these great things for us. You know, make a list that first week of Lent of the things you need to repent of and get rid of and go to confession. But that second week, take these readings I'm reading and make a list. What is the deafness that you need healed? What is your blindness? What is your lameness? What is your suffering? What do you need the Lord to tenderly speak to you and promise? Where do you need him to guide you? 
Who are the, what are the beasts that he needs to remove from your path? This way is for those with a journey to make. On it, the redeemed will walk. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion, singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness. Sorrow and mourning will flee. What sorrow do you want him to comfort? Do you know, have you not heard? The Lord is an eternal God. You know, the Lord in these readings is building up our confidence. He's eternal. He's mighty to save. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint and grow weary. His knowledge is beyond scrutiny. He gives strength to the fainting. For the weak, he makes vigor abound. Though young men faint and grow weary and youths stagger and fall, They that hope in the Lord will renew their strength. He will share all of that strength with you. They will soar as with the eagle's wings. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. I, the Lord your God, teach you what is for your good and lead you in the ways you should go. So we see that first week of repentance. We see the second week of being a tender child in his arms, right? And then we enter the third week of Advent, where the Lord really begins to open up his spousal love for us. We have a husband named Jesus Christ, and he crucified himself to pour out himself, like it says in Ephesians, to make us his bride, his wife, his spouse, holy and without blemish. We see this in Isaiah. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The Lord has chosen Jesus Christ to be our husband, to be our spousal lover. The Lord has anointed me and sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to release to the prisoners, To announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God. That's why Jesus is sent. It reminds me of that part of scripture where it talks about the little girl being born who was rejected and was left to lay in her blood. And the Lord passed by and said, let her grow. And once she grew a little bit older, he came and he chose her as his wife. And he cleaned her. And he put beautiful clothes on her and oil in her hair, and anointed her skin, and jewels that were beautiful, and he made her beautiful with his love. You know, because of our sin, and because of other people's sin towards us, we're that rejected child, that baby laying in the mud. And the Lord might might leave us for just a little bit, not because he doesn't love us, but because he has to wait for the timing of our Father. The same way Israel had to wait. Jesus didn't come, you know, the second chapter of Genesis. God had to prepare the hearts of the people. But when he saw they were ready for love, he came. And just like that little girl, he bathed their body in his own tears and his own blood. He does that to us in spousal love. He makes us beautiful with his own virtue, his own grace. And he says, let just justice descend, O heavens, like dew from above. Let gentle rain, let the skies drop it down. Let the earth open and salvation bud forth. Let justice spring up. I, the Lord, have created this. So he looks at us wallowing and suffering and says, you know what? It's time for not only my mercy, but my justice. And my justice says, I want You know, Mary Clasco, what's your name? To be beautiful, to be mine, to be beloved. So he swoops us up. And he says to us in Isaiah 45, Turn to me and be safe, all you the ends of the earth. I am the God, and there is no other. It's like Ruth in the Old Testament, who lays down at the feet of Obed. And he, he, she says, cover me with your cloak. I need protection. And he does. So many beautiful stories in the Old Testament 
where women need protection. And God sends a protector to cover them with her, their cloak. You know, Joseph did it to Our Lady. And it wasn't in, um, you know, marital sexual love, but it was in real love that was pure. He covered her in his cloak. And even, you know, as Jesus is dying on the cross, he says to St. John, cover my mother, right? Cover her in your cloak of protection. Give her spiritual protection, but give her protection in life. So often priests are called to do that in the world. There is a priest that I know of who runs um, in South America, an orphanage for babies, but oftentimes pregnant single moms will come to him and sometimes he has to go to their doctor appointments with them in order to have them keep their baby, right? But he's extending protection over them. It's really beautiful to read the stories. And then in Isaiah 54, it says, raise a glad cry, you barren one who did not bear, right? Break forth in jubilant song, you who were not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the deserted wife than the children of her who has a husband, says the Lord. You know, sometimes God lets us be that bummer lamb that's rejected in the world. Or he allows us to choose a path like consecrated religious that don't have a concrete husband, right? This can be seen in so many different ways. It can be seen literally as somebody who doesn't have a husband. Or it can be seen just spiritually when you're trying to bear fruit and you're rejected. But what happens to a bummer lamb that's rejected from the fold? The shepherd picks it up and loves it and carries it in his bosom and feeds it and sleeps with it. And what happens? That lamb bonds with the shepherd more than the other sheep. He recognizes his voice quicker and better and obeys stronger. And then he's a guide to the others. So the woman that's forsaken, the woman who isn't bearing fruit, rejoice because the deserted wife, either if you're deserted in this world in a physical way, or if it's more of a spiritual way, God can bear more children from you if you give him those wounds, if you turn to him. Enlarge the space of your tent. That's what we do this third week of Advent. We enlarge the space of our heart. What is making our heart small? The bigger our heart is, the more graces we can receive. Enlarge the space of your tent. Take in that foster child. Make that phone call to the in-law that you don't really like. You know, reach out to the soul asking your spiritual help that you've neglected. You know, Befriend an old friend that might need some encouragement. Enlarge the space of your tent. Spread out your tent cloths unsparingly. Lengthen your ropes and make firm your stakes. For you shall spread abroad to the right and the left. Your descendants shall dispossess the nations and shall people the desolate cities. Fear not, you shall not be put to shame. You have no need to blush. You will not be disgraced. You're not a rejected wife. You're loved by your husband, Jesus. The shame of your youth, you shall forget. The reproach of your widowhood, no longer remember. For he who has become your husband is your maker. If nothing else, meditate on that line this week. He who has become your husband is your maker. His name is the Lord of hosts. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, called God of all the earth. The Lord calls you back like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, a wife married in youth and then cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with great tenderness I will take you back. In an outburst of wrath, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with enduring love I take pity on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. You know, that first week of Advent, he's seeming pretty harsh, but it's so that your heart awakens, right? Sometimes when you're abandoned, your love just grows and grows and grows, you know? And sometimes I'm like, Lord, make so-and-so respond, because then I'll just like go on and be fine, you know? But when people reject me, 
I love them more and I love them more and it drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm like, just make them normal, right? <laughs> Let me go see those babies that I miss so much here and then I'll go on. But instead, my heart is awakened in this love that's an angst that I just can't get over, right? But God does that to increase our thirst so that the tent of our heart is expanded so we can receive more, right? He's quiet or he hides so that our thirst increases. He did that in Israel from the time of the first sin until he came as Savior. And he did it, you know, um, with us personally. He abandons us sometimes. He, he, he gives us a time of quiet, of longing. This is for me like the days of Noah. When I swore that the waters of Noah should never again deluge the earth, so I have sworn not to be angry with you or rebuke you. Though the mountains leave their place and the hills be shaken, my love shall never leave you, nor my covenant of peace be shaken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. And he's building our trust. You know, you have to trust someone when you don't see their response. You know, um... There are, can be people in your life that you just know are untrustworthy. And then there are people that you just trust. And even if they respond funny to you, um, you, you know them. And so you just trust. You continue to, to offer that gift of trust in them, right? Sometimes you see, um, you know, that with a child with their parent and the parent is you know, late to pick them up from somewhere. But the child's not afraid. They're like, oh, something must have happened. But I know my mommy. She'll come back. She always comes back, right? God sometimes gives us this little bit of time so that our trust is built up. And then the last week of Advent is the consummation of a union with Jesus, our Savior, right? So he kind of goes through and he tells us who he is and how he's coming and how he's going to be one with us. He tells us, observe what is right, do what is just, for my salvation is about to come and my justice is about to be revealed. He's saying, I'm coming, right? No more shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate. You are going to be called my delight. He's building our desire. Your land is going to be called espoused. For the Lord delights in you. He makes your land a spouse. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. And then the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. Kind of like, you know, the shepherds, you know, saw the angels in the sky and the king saw the star. A great Jesus came to be our light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom and depression, right? A light is shown. His name is Christ. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing as they rejoice before you as at the harvest, as people make merry when dividing spoils. For the yoke that burdened them, the pole on their shoulder, the rod of their taskmaster, you have smashed as on the day of Midian. He comes and with his little baby tears, he smashes Satan. For every boot that trampled in battle, every cloak rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for flames. He will get rid of anything, not of his father's kingdom. For a child is born to us. He doesn't come to us as a scary, you know, um, warrior. How does he come to Our Lady? Through the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is also called the Comforter, hidden within her womb and her heart. That's how he comes as a baby to us. We might not always recognize his presence. It's not with the bang and the boom. It's in that littleness. It's in that silence. It's in the hiddenness. It's in the meek love. A child is born to us. A son is given to us. Upon his shoulder dominion rests. They named him Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Forever Faithful, Father, Prince of Peace. 
Maybe take this week that list and meditate. What does that mean for God, for Jesus to be your wonder counselor, your God hero, your father forever and your prince of peace? His dominion is vast and forever peaceful from David's throne and over his kingdom, which he confirms and sustains by judgment and justice, both now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, the Lord proclaims to the ends of the earth, say to daughter Zion, your savior comes. It's time right now. You know, the time of birth has come. The time of that embrace, the time of his love consuming us. Here he is. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. They shall be called a holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. You shall be called frequented. A city that's not forsaken, that's not rejected. How beautiful among the mountains are the feet of him who brings glad tidings, announcing peace, bearing good news, announcing salvation, saying to Zion, your God is king. The lessons that we learn in Advent through these readings in a special way are those lessons of waiting of patient waiting, right? And have, have that hope and that faith and that trust that in the end he'll come as an all-consuming love. And the more that we love and the more that we search, the more that we thirst, the greater he'll come. Our lady longed so greatly for the Savior that he came. And he came a few years before the prophecies had foretold. And they say that it was Our Lady's longing and thirst united with Joseph's as a sacrifice that drew him from heaven. He couldn't look at his mama's heart beating for him any longer without coming to embrace her within her womb. We desire and we ask for the grace of a patient waiting and of an all-consuming thirst with faith, hope, love, and trust so that the Lord may look upon us that way and come. And here at the very end, I just want to touch on the O antiphons. The week before Christmas is when you hear these O antiphons in the readings and in the, um, in the Alleluia verses. And that's what we sing in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, right? So the first one is O Wisdom. O wisdom, O holy word of God, you govern all creation with your strong yet tender care. Come, O come, wisdom on high. Show your people the way to salvation. Right? And then we can see where this is present in scripture. How the wisdom of God comes in the book of wisdom in Isaiah and Proverbs and John. So wisdom is the first title we give to Jesus as we're waiting and longing for him. Then we say, O come, O come, O Adonai, O sacred Lord of ancient Israel, who showed yourself to Moses in the burning bush, who gave him the holy law on Sinai's mountain. Come, O Adonai, O sacred Lord, stretch out your mighty hand to set us free. And we see that in Exodus, in Isaiah, in Micah, and in Acts. So first we say, O come, great wisdom. O come, Lord Adonai. O come, stem of Jesse, flower of Jesse's stem, right? That's from Isaiah and from Romans. O flower of Jesse's stem, you have been raised up as a sign for all peoples. Kings stand silent in your presence. The nations bow down and worship before you. Come, O flower of Jesse's stem, who is like the Savior, the Deliverer, that comes through the family lineage, the family lineage that committed sin, the family lineage that prepared for his coming. A beautiful shoot, a little rosebud, a pure flower comes forth from Jesse's stem. Come, let nothing keep you from coming to our aid. And then we say, O key of David, come, royal power of Israel. 
controlling at your will the gate of heaven. Come, O key of David. Break down the prison walls of death for those who dwelled in darkness and the shadow of death. Lead your captive people into freedom. O key of David. That's from Revelation and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Matthew and Luke. And then December 21st, O radiant dawn, we call him, come. Splendor of eternal light. It's what we're talking about. Jesus is coming as our light. O radiant dawn, splendor of eternal light, son of justice, come and shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. We hear the Lord called radiant dawn and light in Isaiah and Malachi and Luke and John and in Revelation. December 22nd, O King of the nations, come, O come, King of the nations, Christ our King, the only joy of every human heart. O keystone of the mighty ark of man, come and save the creature that you fashioned from the dust. And we hear Christ called our King in Isaiah, in the Psalms, in Jeremiah, in Daniel, in Haggai, in Romans, and in Ephesians. And on December 23rd, that's when we are calling him Emmanuel. God is with us. O come, O come, Emmanuel, King and lawgiver, desire of the nations, savior of the people, come and set us free, Emmanuel, Lord our God. And he's called Emmanuel in Isaiah and in Matthew and in Timothy. It's so beautiful to see this plan of God to prepare us for his coming throughout all of scripture, right? We see it throughout everything. All of salvation history was to bring us this tiny baby who is to grow up to embrace us and to be our savior and to draw us in his arms into heaven forever. It's a big forever. So now at the end, I'm just, I'm going to sing those O antiphons again. I'm going to sing once more, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And I ask you to really make a list here. You know, that first week is repentance. And I, I'm sure that you thought a lot about that when I talked about poverty. But then the second week, being that little child. What do you want the Lord to tenderly speak to you? How do you need him to shepherd and love you that way? And go deep into the mass readings every day. And then that third week is his spousal love. How is God spousally reacting to you and trying to help you? Where do you need to grow in that? And in that last week then, focus on the consummation of baby Jesus taking flesh in your life. You know, he came and became flesh in the womb of Our Lady, but when we receive the Eucharist, we have a chance for baby Jesus to live and be inside of us. How does he want to live in us? And then as an adult, when we're one with him, our Savior on the cross, how does he want to die with us? How does he want to be resurrected with us? How does he want to recreate us? And how is it that he wants the Spirit to fill our lives? That's the mystery of Christmas. So we'll sing this one more time and then we'll be done.
shall come to the Come the rod of Jesse free Thine own from Satan's tyranny From depths of hell thy people say Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer. Our spirits by thine advent near Disperse the gloomy clouds of night And death's dark shadow put to Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou key of David. Make safe the way our head, oops, that leads on high. Sorry. <laughs> and close the path of misery. Rejoice, rejoice. Tribes on Sinai's height In ancient times did give the law In cloud and majesty and all Rejoice Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in 
and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.